wanted to encourage you in regards to Don and Gene McClure, uh, guys. Uh, Don McClure was my mentor, my pastor. You're going to be blessed when you come out for the men's conference. Um, I, I don't think I've met a man who has more wisdom than Don McClure. And then for the, the couples uh, seminar that Don and Gene are going to put together, um, I'm, I'm going to share something that's very private, but uh, in our first year of marriage, um, we were having struggles. I'm just sharing with you. Uh, I thought I was perfect. <laughs> I couldn't understand why she was so upset. <laughs> she went and met with some pastor. Uh, his name was Don McClure. She said, you might want to go meet with him. And I'm like, yeah, he'll hear my side of the story and I'll set him straight. <laughs> and I came back and apologized to my wife. And we're now celebrating 33 years of marriage. So, <laughs> yeah, um, and and I, and that Gene is do- joining Pastor Don. Um, I I learned from Don because if if a woman can remain married to a man that difficult, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That, Pastor Don's a wonderful guy. Uh, yeah, it's hard to work for, but uh, yeah. Tremendous wisdom both of them possess, and you're going to be blessed. So sign up for that. I hope it's sold out. I really do. Um, and then I want to tell you that uh, on the 21st of this month was our 33rd wedding anniversary, and it was the longest anniversary. We left uh, Tel Aviv at midnight, so I had a 30-hour anniversary. <laughs> and we really did nothing but sleep the whole way, and we came back exhausted, and uh, yet... It was a tremendous trip. Um, I was blessed. I don't know if you know, but Garrett, who does uh, all of our video stuff, he was on the trip, and I think he's trying to apply to be a war correspondent because on Ramadan, he decided to take some of the young people and go to the Temple Mount, which, you know, (laughs) suffice it to say, that's crazy stupid. (laughs) And they got up to the front, and uh, they're like, you're white and you're Christian. You don't belong here. Leave. Okay. All right. So off they went. And they're, they're still alive, and I'm glad. That's very good. Very dangerous. I give them freedom to do as they please, as long as it's not that, Garrett, okay? Let's keep that in mind. But it was a great trip. It's good to be back. Um, before uh, I, I, I share the message God's given me, I want you to meet somebody. Um, and I'm, I'm a strong supporter of this organization for 22 years as a pastor of this church. Every year we've invited them. They uh, have been going strong for, I think, over 100 years, maybe close to, if not over. And um, they're the Gideons. They're the ones that pass out Bibles. And uh, they've been faithful to this calling, getting Bibles into the hands of servicemen, hotels, students. And uh, there are now, gosh, over 2 billion Bibles have been passed out, I think, maybe more. But John will tell you more about that. And one last thing about the the Gideons. Uh, I, I went to a breakfast a long time ago in San Jose, and I heard... Uh, a Gideon from Ireland, uh, he had shared his testimony how he had uh, been an IRA terrorist and the, he had been arrested and put in prison and the Gideons came through passing out Bibles to prisoners and he, he got one because he was a smoker and the Gideon's Bible is onion skin paper. It's real thin. It's really good for rolling cigarettes. And this is a true story. He smoked through Matthew, Mark, Luke and halfway through John... <laughs> And he came to Christ. Uh, yeah. John Rotol is here. He's going to share with you. He is a faithful Gideon in our community. And uh, I really, listen, it's our anniversary. I know you all want to buy us a gift. Don't buy us a gift. Just support the Gideons. Amen? Amen. Let's welcome John. Come on up, brother. Where are you? A young lady contemplating suicide in the middle of winter went to a bridge to end it all. As she climbed up on the railing, ready to send her body into the ice-cold water, a leaf blew in her face. As she pulled the leaf out of her face, she looked down, and it wasn't a leaf at all. It was a page torn out from a Gideon Bible. She looked down at the page, and all she seen was, God is merciful. 
she decided to get down from the bridge to go seek someone who could tell her about this page. She found two Christians who the Christians led her to the pastor, and the pastor led her to the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll ask you this morning, how important is just one page from God's holy word? Well, yet it's a known fact that 95% of people attending church today have never, ever led somebody to the Lord before. You know, before I joined the Gideons, I was one of those people. And I went to a meeting about witnessing, actually the first meeting that I've ever attended for the Gideons. And the guy there said, are you praying for somebody that needs Jesus in their heart? I raised my hand. But he asked a second question, which convicted me. He said, if you've been praying for somebody that needs Christ in their life, have you given the word of God to them? I went to the sales table that day, and I bought me a box of these. And I didn't go home to my wife. I went home to my dad. You see, I'd been praying for my dad for eight years that he would somehow, some way, receive Christ. I grew up in a family where my mother was a believer, took me to church. And when I got to my dad's house that day, I was just going to do what he said. Just give them the word of God. And I told my dad, Dad, I have a gift for you. And he says, a gift? He said, what are you giving me this for, John? I says, Dad, because I've been praying for you for eight years every day. And he says, well, that's real nice, but what have you been praying for me about? I said, wow, I didn't know this was coming. So I went through the gospel with my dad, and I asked my dad to promise to read that. You know, one month later, my dad called me at my office, and he said, John, I'm a foolish man. I said, Dad, I wish you'd quit saying that. You know, you started this business. It's successful. You're retired now. Don't keep saying it. Dad, I'm not saying it about that. I'm saying it because I'm a foolish man and I need Jesus Christ in my life. Well, I wish you could see that day I went over to my dad's house. And my dad and I got down on our knees. And he went through the plan of salvation in one of these little books. And he received Christ as his Savior. You know, God's word said it will not return void. First person ever that I led to the Lord. Praise God. Well, you might say, well, who are these Gideons and what is their purpose? Well, the Gideons are Christian businessmen and professional men. And their only purpose, first of all, is to witness to somebody, not to place the scriptures. The second thing is to place the scriptures in the traffic lanes of national life. You know, we do this in over 200 countries. We place Bibles in five strategic areas, hotels and motels, schools, from fifth grade to the college level, prisons, military, and hospitals. We call this the traffic lanes of national life. And you know, you are the ones that provide the Bibles. The Gideons only place them. We're the servants for the Lord. We're the vessels for the Lord. So we come to say thank you. How can you help? Well, today you may have received one of these inserts. You can pull one of those out, and there's an envelope. You could mail it. You can give it to one of us at the table. But more than that, maybe you're here today, and you've never, ever led somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have two ways. One, join the Gideons. Two, become a friend of the Gideons so that you can pass out scriptures yourself to witness to those who need Christ. God bless you, and thank you so much. So that was great. Here you go. Oh, you're just a mess. You're dropping it everywhere. Oh, you, yeah. You want the water? I'll give it to you. All right. Uh, one last thing before we get into the word. Um, the young lady, her name is Grace. Uh, where is she? Oh, there you are, Grace. She's from Karis Bible College. Um, and I met her. Um, she is part of a ministry called Life is for Everyone. It's a pro, pro-life ministry ministry. And when I meet young people that are just really performing well in their area of calling, 
I always say, come on out to God speak. I want to encourage you. And I'd say one in nine take me up on the offer. And she came on out and the staff put her up in a hotel and she's here. And I want you to make sure that you just bless her. So stand up, Grace. Let everyone see you. Here she is. She's a glutton for punishment. She sat through the first service. Now she's having to go with the third and the second, third, and hang in there. All right, let's, uh, if you have a Bible, open up to Genesis chapter 13. If you don't have a Bible, you're the only one passing out Bibles today, huh? Wow. They're abusing you. Where are the men? Okay, come on, let's get busy. Back there holding Bibles, doing nothing. No, I'm just kidding. Kind of. <laughs> Genesis chapter 13. Uh, this doesn't coincide with our anchored reading, but I was moved in our anchored reading because while I was in Israel, I was reading through Leviticus, especially Leviticus 23. Uh, um, it was this week's reading, and it went through all the festivals and the feasts. And we happen to be in Israel uh, during Pesach, which is Passover, um, and also Ramadan. They coincided along with the Easter. It's an interesting calendar year. We were there for the Holocaust Memorial Day where the entire nation stopped. And, it, you know, we were silent for, for uh, two minutes while the sirens blared and everyone just stood still. Freeways, everything. They just got out of their car and stood there. Except for in the Muslim quarters, they were obnoxious and rude. But in Tel Aviv and other portions where it's very strongly uh, Israeli, complete silence. I was moved by our Messianic guides. Uh, they're, they're Jewish by birth and Messianic by faith. Um, and and their, their understanding of the festivals and the feasts. And I was deeply touched. And then I was burdened all at the same time. Because I'm realizing our young people are being indoctrinated in this horrific theology uh, called replacement theology. If you don't know what replacement theology is, you will by the end of the service. And it's, it's, it's very concerning to me. And, and some of my friends, and I don't believe that they embrace replacement theology out of anti-Semitism. I just believe they're misguided. Love hopes all things. Um, they, they hold to this position, which is concerning to say the least, but it creates anti-Semitism. And you really have to twist the scriptures to, to come up with replacement theology. Um, and I'll explain what it is momentarily, but before I do, we're gonna have a reading uh, just to establish some areas for ourselves in regards to God and his um, title deed. You see, we went to Qumran which is near the Dead Sea. It's the lowest point on earth. And in Qumran, a young shepherd boy in 1947 saw one of his sheep or goats go into a cave. He took a rock and tried to throw it in there to get the goat out. And he heard a clay jar breaking. He went in and he found vellum manuscripts that were to become and be known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest the oldest manuscript of, of the Bible we have. And, and it, it, it outdates any work of antiquity of original manuscripts by thousands of years. Uh, the Bible makes every other work of antiquity, Homer's Iliad, etc., to just seem silly compared to the cross-referencing and original manuscripts we possess of the scriptures themselves. And of course, that was found in 1947. In 1948, Israel will become a nation. And even secular archaeologists in Israel realize the importance of the scripture because that's God's title deed to the land. This is your land. And, and everywhere that they dig that the Bible says something exists, they find it. And it's a remarkable land, and we're going to cover that in our time together because it seems in vogue to be anti-Semitic, but you're not anti-Semitic, you're just pro-Palestinian. Well, you really are confused. Um, you think you're not anti-Semitic, but... You don't understand this BDS and all the other things where they try to destroy the economy of Israel. Uh, it's tragic. Israel's the only democracy in the Middle East. 
surrounded by its enemies. They've all tried to invade it. It's had victory over all of them. It had a remarkable birth in 1948. So they get their title deed restored in 47, and they get, they're, they're born in 48. UN put it together. And, and, and just the history of it is fascinating. And it was all prophesied, by the way. But the church wants to say, well, no, that's not the case, and Israel's not special, and neither are Jews. Hmm. Let's take a look at Genesis 13. Please stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. We're going to pick up at verse 14. I'll read out loud if you'll follow along silently. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants. Everyone say that word together. No, 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 no. The other word that's after it. Now let's try that again. To your descendants. Forever. You know what the word means in Hebrew? Yeah, forever. <laughs> and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I'll give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees in Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word. And truly, God, you gave the land to his descendants forever. And Lord, even in Genesis 15, you place an exclamation point on that as you were the only one to pass through the pieces of the covenant. Lord, let us all come to deeply understand that though Israel's not perfect, they are still your firstborn. Help us, God, to understand this Help folks to be attentive. We commit all this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Grab a seat if you would. When Michelle and I first started going to Israel, and this has now been my 18th trip, I'm going to go again in August and again in February of next year and more to come. When we first started going, to find a Messianic Jew was like trying to find a unicorn. They just didn't exist. Um, we work with Sarel Travel, and the owner is a Messianic Jew, has a Messianic congregation. And when we started at, uh, going on these trips, there was probably maybe two to 3,000 Messianic Jews in all of Israel. Today, there's 40,000 plus, and it's growing rapidly. The Orthodox community wants nothing to do with the Christian community. And um, in the Knesset, they tried to outlaw evangelism uh, directly addressed to the Christian community. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and, and the majority shot that down. But that was put forward by the Orthodox community. Well, interestingly enough, even in the Orthodox community, they're starting to see some change um, Yair Levy is a very, very popular singer in Israel, and he's Orthodox. Now, the Orthodox community doesn't participate, for the most part, in the IDF, Israeli Defense Force. All citizens of Israel required, um, they have a draft and everyone, but the only portion of Israel that isn't demanded is the Orthodox community, which upsets the rest of Israel because they're fighting and they get to do nothing. Well, Yair participated, and he didn't have to, but he went into the IDF, and he, be he became the equivalent of, of our Navy SEALs. The guy's a beast. And he was the liaison uh, for Israel, uh, the IDF Special Forces, with America's Special Forces, and worked with the Navy SEALs, and realized how many of them were Christians, at least the ones that he considered to be honorable. And he said this, and I won't, I'll never forget it. He said, it's as though the, he said this verbatim. It's as though the scales on my eyes had been removed. I'm like, whoa, I don't think you understand what you're just saying, but we'll leave it at that. <laughs> and then that night he came, Sean Foyt was with us, and Sean is a, a very sought-after musician, and, and he's grown in popularity since he's defied tyranny, and he'd lost uh, music contracts and recording contracts and and yet it didn't phase him. He just continued to do what he does. And people around the world are moved by him. And Yair was one of them. And he reached out to Sean knowing he was in Israel looking at his uh, social media. And he said, do you think we could collaborate and get together? 
Now, this is an Orthodox Jew wanting to get together with an evangelical Christian. And, and Sean said, what do you think? I said, let's do it, you know? I mean, w- w- all things are permissible, not all things are profitable. This is cool. Let's do it. And so Sean reaches out to him, and he agrees to come. And when he came, he said, you know, I, I was only given permission because I, I had to ask permission from my Orthodox rabbi. And I, he said, I candidly didn't think he'd let me go. But he said, um, go, build a bridge. Yeah, amen. He had written a song um, that was very popular, and it's going to be hard for you to understand it because it's in Hebrew, but he'd written a song that really ministered to Israel during the pandemic when everyone was locked down and started to draw people to the scriptures. And he's got a really sweet spirit about him. And he started, there's just something happening in this man's life, and you can just sense it. This, This never would happen. So he comes and performs in front of all of us with Sean, and um, here's a portion of it so you guys can take a look at it. It was really sweet. So I'm here in Galilee with my friend Yair, and he is going to bless us with a beautiful song in Hebrew. sweet. What was remarkable about the trip is things like that don't happen. They just, they just don't happen. It's, you think that's common. It is not common. And uh, there was something special about that night. God was moving and moving in his heart as well. He was touched. And he turned to Sean. He said, let's collaborate with a, uh, an Arab woman who is a, a Christian, I believe. She, he said to her, to Sean, and we'll do the song in Arabic, in English, and in Hebrew. And uh, so they're going to get together and do this song. I mean, this is, this is incredible. What drew him to Sean was his heart to defy tyranny. And then we went to dinner with some of the folks that had, uh, that had come on the trip just to get to know people, which is the part I like the most. I, I miss being a pastor, and the group is smaller, so I get a chance to get to know folks. And Michelle and I went to dinner with some folks as best we could, and there was one lady in particular, and I won't say her name because I didn't ask for permission, but she did say to us when I, I said, how did you get connected with God speak, and how's this trip ministering to you? And, and in tears, she said, you know, I, I candidly kind of was, I think, new age or something along those lines, and came to God speak because of the politics, and I stayed for Jesus. <laughs> uh, that's... That's precious. And, and I, I see this happening, and I'm moved by it. But now we come to this place where as these, these new believers, and we baptized, I think, almost everybody, not everybody, the lion's share in the Jordan, and, and it was precious testimonies. Um, but then I started to realize that the young people in America are embracing wholeheartedly replacement theology and I'll explain that to you, like I said, momentarily, but it's, it's troublesome because, uh, and you'll see why. But before I take you through that, I wanted to read to you, we just read out of Genesis 13. I want to read to you in Genesis 15. The promise was made that Abraham's descendants would be as numerous as the sands of the sea, if they could be numbered, and it'll be forever. And Abraham uh, was concerned because he had no children So Genesis 15, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram, I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, look, you have have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. He's saying, you promised me in 13. Now I'm uh, over 100 and I got nothing. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Sarah, or Sarai at this time, her name will be changed. She's in her 90s. You can't find a gynecologist in all of Israel that's going to say, yeah, she's going to get pregnant. OBGYN, I think, is probably a better term. 
And, and he says, but from your body will be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and God accounted it to him for righteousness. It, he, all he did was believe what God said and he was made righteous. We're, we're not righteous because of what we do. We're righteous because of what he's done. And we take that by faith. And that's Abram. He, he was saved by grace through faith. He believed God, credited to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And then he brought all these to him and they cut them in two down the middle, placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away and exhausted him by doing this. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. And then he said to Abram, Know certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them for 400 years. This is Egypt. Also, the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions, which they did in the Exodus. Now, as for you, you shall go down to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On that same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the, uh, the Rephaim, Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the termites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. <laughs> Abraham cut a covenant. You take the two pieces, you cut them in half. The dove and the pigeon are not cut. The blood pours down into the crevice between the two pieces, and you walk through holding the hand of the other. It's called cutting a covenant. May, if I break my end of the deal or my bargain, may this happen to me, this blood, may I die. May death be the only thing that causes me I will not break this covenant. It's everlasting. Well, Abraham, waiting for God to show up to hold his hand and to go through this covenant, falls asleep. And while he falls asleep, uh, the, the fire passes through the pieces, and that's the Lord. The Lord goes through, but Abraham sound asleep. What does that mean? That, mean, that means God makes a covenant. God makes a covenant, right? And Abraham isn't required to do anything. God says, let God be true and every man a liar. I'm going to fulfill what I said I'm going to do with or without you, Abraham. So the promise in 13 and also in 15 is made by God and sealed by God. Well, replacement theology is problematic. Replacement theology was introduced to the church shortly after the Gentile leadership took over from the Jewish leadership. The premise of this belief or that Israel, the Jewish people in the land, are replaced by the Christian church to fulfill the purposes of God and to become the historic continuation of Israel to the exclusion of the former. And what is replacement theology? According to replacement theology, post-Pentecost event of Acts chapter 2, the term Israel as found in the Bible now refers to the church. Therefore, the Jewish people are now no longer a chosen people. They are no different from any other national group, such as the English, Spanish, and French. So it, it just reduces them to just normal people. They're not God's chosen people. But the church is now the chosen one. Yeah, it's problematic. And they say, well, they, 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 they disobeyed God. Everybody's disobeyed God. God passed through the pieces. Abraham was sound asleep. I didn't do anything for my salvation except for receive a free gift. It's by faith, through grace. It's a gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. I didn't earn it. I don't even deserve it. I received it, which means I was grafted. I was adopted. Israel's the firstborn. I'm adopted. That bugs people. You don't want to be adopted. Too stinking bad. I'll tell you what, I don't love Natasha any less than the other children because she's been adopted and grafted in the McCoy family. She's a McCoy through and through. And I'm going to say this. I, I relate more to Natasha than probably any of the other kids. <laughs> Amen. Now, let me, let me add this. 
this replacement theology is a result of the fact that there's anti-Semitism in the world. And, and Orthodox Jews are a peculiar people. You see them on the airplane. When we were flying over, they want to genuflect and do their prayers in the gathering areas. And, and to the point where the steward, the, the airline attendants and the pilots saying, you, there's no praying in the center sections. Don't do this. We've been through this before. They come over and we had a bulkhead where there was extra room and they were like right in your face bowing. And you're like, come on, dude, I paid for the seat. <laughs> and they're, you know, and, and they, they don't understand like lines. You know, you're in line for buff. Everything in Israel is a buffet, and you're going in the line. And Americans are, like, very, very compliant, you know. And they're like, er, right in front. And you're like, whoa, hey, what the? I am Orthodox. And you're like, yeah, you're rude is what you are. <laughs> and you get upset about it, and you just, you just see that, and you're kind of, well. And they got the curly things. <laughs> and, and, and phylacteries hanging on their head, and they're and you're, and you don't get it and you don't understand it and you, it's odd. But that doesn't mean you get to replace them. Replacement theology teaches that apart from repentance, the new birth and incorporation into the church, the Jewish people have no future, no hope, no calling in the plan of God. The promises, covenants, blessings ascribed to Israel in the Bible have been taken away from the Jews and given to the church, which has superseded them. However, the Jews are subject to the curses found in the Bible as a result of their rejection of Christ. This is problematic. Is there a basis for replacement theology in Scripture? A couple of passages that my brethren who hold to this theology believe. The favorite starting point for this doctrine is found in the chastisement of the backsliding Israel by the prophet Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. He declares, The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She's gone up every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said, after she has done all these things, turn thou unto me. But she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but, when, but went and played the harlot also." That's one of their passages that they say that they have lost this chosen position. Also, you find in Matthew 21, Jesus very sternly says in uh, Matthew 21, 43, during the latter stages of his ministry, he spoke of severe judgment on the nation of Israel. Therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And this was along the lines of 70 AD when the Romans absolutely obliterated the Jewish people, killed over a million of them, by the way. And you have Masada, which was the last holdout of the Israelites. It was kind of the, the Alamo of Israel. And, uh, and you can see the Roman entrenchments at the base of, of Masada. It's fascinating. And they take every single IDF soldier, Israeli Defense Force soldier, up to Masada and say, never let this happen again, because from that day... Um, Israel wasn't a nation until 1948. So they get, their, they, they, they get the, the title deed found by this shepherd boy in a cave in 1947. They get possession of the land in 48. But people still say that they've been replaced. It's, it's bizarre to me. They say, well, Romans, Paul speaks of it. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. He says, just, just, you don't, just because you, 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 you snip a portion of the body doesn't make you a Jew. It's a circumcision of the heart, but that still doesn't negate Israel's place as the firstborn. There's a history of replacement theology that is very anti-Semitic. And here are some historians through time. Ignatius of Antioch, he taught that those who partake of the Passover are partakers with those who killed Jesus. Justin Martyr, early church father, claimed God's covenant with Israel was no longer valid and that Gentiles had replaced the Jews. Arrhenius declared that Jews were disinherited from the grace of God. Tertullian blamed the Jews for the death of Jesus and argued they had been rejected by God. Origen, he was responsible for much anti-Semitism, all of which was based on his assertion that the Jews were responsible for killing Jesus. The Romans killed Jesus, by the way. That would mean us. We're Gentiles. Oh, you don't like that. 
The Council of Nicaea in Anatolia prohibited Christians from sharing a meal with a Jew, marrying a Jew, blessing a Jew, or observing the Sabbath. They changed the celebration of the resurrection from the Jewish feast of first fruits to Easter in an attempt to disassociate it from Jewish feasts. The council stated, For it is unbecoming beyond measure that on this holiest of festivals we should follow the customs of the Jews. Henceforth, let us have nothing in common with these odious people. Eusebius wrote, Taught that the promises of Scripture were meant for the Gentiles and the curses were meant for the Jews. He asserted that the church was the true Israel. Hilary of Poitiers wrote, Jews are a perverse people, accursed by God forever. Gregory of Nyssa, Bishop of Cappadocia, wrote, the Jews are a brood of vipers, haters of goodness. Jerome in the third century wrote, he describes the Jews as serpents wearing an image of Judas. Their psalms and prayers are are the braying of donkeys. And then Augustine, of all people, he's one of the church fathers. He's a believer. He's a good guy. But he wrote and he asserted that Jews deserve death but were destined to wander the earth to witness the victory of the church over the synagogue. During the Middle Ages, passion plays abounded and they were used to cultivate hatred towards the Jewish people. In 1478, Pope Sixtus IV that's weird. Granted the monarchs of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabel, the right to establish a special inquisition in Spain to deal with baptized Jews who were suspected of remaining faithful to Judaism. Thousands were burned at the stake by order of the Spanish Inquisition. In 1492, King Ferdinand decided that all Spanier, Spanish Jews should be banned from Spain. It was feared that Jews were a danger to Christianity. Approximately 150,000 Jews were forced to leave Spain. Uh, John Christosom, and these are a few more of Christianity's long history of Jewish hatred. He wrote, They, the Jews, are become worse than the wild beasts with their own hands. They murder their own offspring to worship the avenging devils who are the foes of our life. The synagogues of the Jews are the homes of idolatry and devils. They are worse even than heathen circuses. I hate the Jews, for they have the law and they insult it. Peter the Venerable wrote, Yes, you Jews, how long, poor wretches, Will ye not believe the truth? Truly I doubt whether a Jew can be really human. I lead out from its den a monstrous animal and show it as a laughingstock in the amphitheater of the world in the sight of all people. I bring thee forward, thou Jew, thou brute beast in the sight of all men. Oh, where are we going with this? It gets worse. You see, there's a pattern when you remove Israel, the Jew, is God's chosen people. Then you have to allegorize the scriptures, the prophecies concerning Israel. Once replacement theology has been established as a foundational doctrine, it turns all of the prophetic scriptures dealing with the future Israel into mystical predictions about the church. They fall into the trap of changing the primary understanding with any secondary application. Then becomes amillennialism. No millennium, no thousand-year reign. This is a classical misapplication of biblical eschatology. In other words, if there is no literal Israel in the future, then there is no need for a future kingdom. And then anti-Semitism is heavy in the replacement theology world. Hatred of Jews, this is a natural result of arrogance, allegorization, aberration, and amillennialism. Now we're going to get to the father of the Protestant movement. All of us are here because of a protester. His name was Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a rabid anti-Semite. In 1543, Martin Luther wrote a pamphlet entitled, On the Jews and Their Lies. They are a miserable and accursed people, stupid fools, miserable, blind and senseless, thieves and robbers, the great vermin of humanity, and lazy rogues. Luther went on to write, For such ruthless wrath of God is sufficient evidence that they, the Jewish people, assuredly have erred and gone astray. Even a child can comprehend this, for one not dare regard God as so cruel that he would punish his own people so long, so terrible, so unmercifully. Therefore, this work of wrath is proof that the Jews, surely rejected by God, are no longer his people, and neither is he any longer their God. Here's some more that Martin Luther wrote. What shall we Christians do with this damned, rejected race of Jews? His answer, first, there's, first, their synagogue should be set on fire. And this ought to be done for the name of God and of Christianity in order that God may see that we are Christians. Secondly, their homes should be likewise broken down and destroyed. Thirdly, 
They should be deprived of their prayer books and Talmuds. Fourthly, their rabbis must be forbidden under threat of death to teach anymore. anymore. Luther concludes by calling for the genocide of Jews, even if they were punished in the most gruesome manner that the streets ran with their blood, that their dead would be counted not in the hundreds of thousands, but in the millions. Still, they must insist on being right. In some, they are the devil's children, damned to hell. His murderous proclamations against the Jewish existence, he wrote, uh, existence were quoted in Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle, as a basis of support for Hitler's rabid anti-Semitism. Bishop Martin Sass of uh, Thuringia celebrated Martin Luther's birthday with these words on November 10th, 1938. Kristallnacht, by the way. November 10th, 1938, on Luther's birthday, the synagogues are burning in Germany. He then demanded that German people submit to the violent anti-Semitism of Luther, the great anti-Semite of his time. It is no coincidence that Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, the violent rampage of baptized German Christians who burned Jewish synagogues and shops, took place on November 10th, 1938, Luther's birthday. The Holocaust was the natural result of replacement theology's pompous and merciless march through church history. Most of the churches in England are replacement theologists, and this is very, very dangerous, and we're seeing the trend in our young people today. 1924, a Christian gathering in Berlin. Hitler spoke to thousands and received a standing ovation when he made the following proclamation. I believe that today I am acting in accordance with the will of Almighty God as I announce the most important work that Christians could undertake, and that is to be against the Jews and get rid of them once and for all. Wow. That's where this theology leads, and it's leading there now. Anti-Semitism is on the rise, and so is the destruction of Christianity. But what is our rebuttal to replacement theology? It's real simple, and it's a strong rebuttal. All of you repeated the word forever. Let's take a look. Only... One only needs to examine four of the unconditional, unconditional, unconditional covenants, covenants, covenants of God to find ample reason to question the biblical soundness of replacement theology doctrine. The covenant concerning the seed. We took a look at this. After the fall of Adam and Eve, God announced that the salvation of mankind would come through the seed of a woman. Later, the revolution, uh, revelation of the saving seed would be revealed through a Chaldean resident by the name of Abram. Later, be known as Abraham in chapter 12 of the book of Genesis. We read... Now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee and I will make thee a great nation and will bless thee and make thee thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him who curseth thee and it shall be all families, shall all families of the earth be blessed. Also the covenant concerning the land, Abram arrived in the promised land. He hears from God again and the Lord said unto Abram after that lot was separated from him. Lift up thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward, eastward and westward. We read this. And God accredited him as righteousness. The covenant concerning the land goes on. For all the land which thou seest, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land, and thee the length and its breadth For I will give it unto thee. The covenant concerning the throne of David. Number three. Most Christians recognize the significance of the connection between King David and Jesus Christ. The prophet Nathan came to King David and said, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, which I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee and thine house and thy kingdom established forever. Before thee, the throne shall be established forever. Working. (laughs) The covenant concerning the discipline of Israel. Not all the covenants with Israel are pleasant. Solomon's wisdom reveals that he that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chastise him betimes. Moses recorded six progressive punishments, and he would carry out, if you do not obey me. It began with distress, then drought, destruction, disease, desolation, debased mind, ultimately dispersion. From the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon, circa 587 B.C., and to 1948, reinstatement of the nation of Israel 
The Jews have endured more than 2,500 years of discipline during which they were dispersed among the nations of the world. And then the question is just simply this with replacement theology. Is God really finished with Israel? No. The Apostle Paul answered that question with an emphatic declaration. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite. The seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. So, we'll conclude with this. Why is Israel so special? Well, the more sure word of prophecy, it's the only nation on the face of the earth whose language was dead and was revived, Hebrew. It was prophesied that it would be born a nation. There's so many prophecies pertaining to it. And I just say to my brothers and sisters who have embraced replacement theology, would you do me a favor? I will give you an at-cost discount. You come to Israel with us. You come and meet some of these Messianic Jews. You come and spy the land in accordance with the prophecies and see if they've really been fulfilled. To all those watching online that you may be anti-Semitic, not even knowing it by embracing replacement theology, thinking the church has replaced the Jew, just because you, you can't accept the firstborn and you don't like being grafted as adopted, I would encourage you, come to Israel with us. I'll give you an at-cost trip. It'll it just zeroed out. And you come. Your life will be forever changed. You'll be blown away. I can say with conviction that most people who hold to a replacement theology have never seen the miracle of Israel. Fascinating. Ezekiel prophesied prosperity for modern day Israel. It's out of Ezekiel 36, 11. It was fulfilled in the 1900s. Today, Israel is an independent nation as it was in the days of King David. It is one of the world's most prosperous countries. In 1999, Israel had the highest per capita gross domestic product of any nearby country, even though the surrounding countries have many oil resources. This is what it says in Ezekiel 36, 11. I will increase the number of men and animals upon you and they will be fruitful and become numerous. I will settle people on you as in the past and I will make you prosper more than before. Then you will know that I'm the Lord your God. Trees again would grow in Israel. Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, went through Israel and he said it's an insect disease infested swamp land and the rest of it is d desert, treeless desert. And he was right. It had been raped and abused and pilfered and there was nothing left of the land. Now, over 200 million trees have been planted by the Jews. It's one big forest. It's stunningly beautiful. And the variety of trees is fascinating. This was Isaiah 41, verses 18 to 20. The lack of available water, including rain, is the one reason why Israel has been desolate, unproductive land during much of the past 2,000 years. But during the 1900s, that when the Jews returned to their ancient homeland, they built a network of irrigation systems. Drip irrigation was invented by the Jew. They just had limited water, and they wanted to make it go to a great extent. During the past century, 200 million trees have been planted. Here is the verse from Isaiah 41. I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched grounds into, into springs. I will put in the desert the cedar and the acacia, the myrtle and the olive, all of which I've witnessed personally. I will set pines in the wasteland and the fir and the cypress together so that people may see and know, may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this, that the Holy One of Israel has created it. Isaiah also writes in chapter 27, verse 6, that Israel's fruit would fill the world. They are the number one exporter of fruit to the Middle East. He prophesied this. Isaiah 27, 6 says, In the days to come, Jacob will take root, Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. Micah 4.1 prophesied that Jerusalem would become the world's most important religious site. So we have the Dome, the dome of the Rock, the Temple Mount, and Christianity, which is Mount Moriah, Golgotha. Four and a half billion people call that the center location of their place of worship. Micah writes in Micah 4, 1, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains and will be raised above the hills and the peoples will stream to it. I remember when we came through, and we came through the tunnel and, and we, were, we played a song, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, lift up your gates and sing, Hosanna in the highest. As we're coming through and you hear this song, there's the the Dome of the Rock, the Temple Mount, and everybody on the bus is crying. It's breathtaking. Oh, but it's replaced. It's not important. You haven't been there. It takes your breath away. 
Almost finished. Hang in there. Zechariah 8 prophesied the Jews were to turn to Jerusalem. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will save my people from the countries of the east and the west. I will bring them back to live in Jerusalem. They will be my people and I will be faithful and righteous to them as their God. It took 2,600 years. Babylon had been destroyed. Uh, Babylon destroyed Jerusalem. There was diaspora. Romans killed more than a million Jews, forced them into exile. Jews haven't had control of Jerusalem. Jews wouldn't get control of Jerusalem until 1967 in the Six-Day War. And yet, all of a sudden, they're returning. Israel's deserts will become like the Garden of Eden, Isaiah 51.3. This is fascinating. Again, 200 million trees recently. Is, um, the, the passage says, The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on her ruins, and he will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the Garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her thanksgiving and uh, sounds of singing. And then this is the last one. Isaiah foretold the worldwide return of the Jews to Israel. This is out of Isaiah 43, 5, and 6. It's a fascinating passage. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give up, give them up. Interesting. In the north, he says, give them up. To the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Why would he say such a thing? Romans had destroyed the city of Jerusalem. The Jews had been scattered to virtually every country in the world, but during the past century, millions of Jews have returned to Israel from the east, west, north, and south. From the east, many Jews living in the Middle East moved to Israel by the early 1900s. From the west, during the mid-1900s, hundreds of thousands of Jews living in the west, Europe and the United States began moving to Israel from the north. Remember, give them up. The former Soviet Union, Russia, in the north of Israel, it refused to allow its Jewish residents to move to Israel, but after years of pressure from other countries, Russia finally began to allow Jews to return to Israel during the 1980s. So far, hundreds of thousands of Russian Jews have moved to Israel. From the south, same thing, give them up. Ethiopia, which is south of Israel, also refused to allow its Jews to return to Israel. But in 1985, Israel struck a deal with Ethiopia's communist government to allow the Jews of Ethiopia to move to Israel. And on the weekend of May 25th, 1991, 14,500 Ethiopian Jews were airlifted to Israel. And uh, Isaiah's prophecy was also correct in saying that the north, Russia, and the south, Ethiopia would have to be persuaded to give up their Jews. I, I, you want me to keep going or are you convinced yet? And what's the application of all this? The application is, I will, I will bless those who bless Israel. Your children need to understand, look, Israel's got issues. The, the IDF force, and they call them the, the land of, of, of life. They're the antithesis. They have the highest abortion rate of, of any democracy in the Western world. They've got their issues. They have got their issues. But when you meet a Messianic Jew and you go through the land, you're looking at it going, this is crazy. I mean, think about it. You had to, they didn't, Hebrew wasn't spoken in any country. And, and, and everyone had, all the street signs had to be in Hebrew, school books in Hebrew, all the people had to be educated in Hebrew. Try doing that. I don't even, to this day, I don't even know how they did it. And you look at the, the more sure word of prophecy, all the fulfillment of it, and you say, oh, no, God's done with Israel. First of all, God never gives up. Never. And it's burdensome to the church that we think we'd be adopted. Get over it. And they're peculiar. So are you. <laughs> the Bible says that. It says you're a peculiar people. I'm, I'm part of it. I'm... You know, like I always say, it's the bar scene out of Star Wars. Boop, 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 boop. Look around, it's peculiar. But God purposed to do this. My Messiah was Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. Just saying. He wasn't, he wasn't just Jewish, he is Jewish. He's alive. He's at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. If you or anyone you know is struggling with replacement theology, have them come with us to Israel. You'll be forever changed. And I challenge you. 
I challenge you. You come, and, and for, for folks like the Finocchio brothers who I adore, they're brilliant guys and they've done so much for Christendom, their replacement theology is what is baffling to me, but I'd say to Gabe and his brother, look, I'll pay for you to come. Just come to Israel with us. Any of these folks that have influence over young people, come with me. I want to introduce you so that you will have your eyes open. And like Mr. Levy, the scales will be removed. God's doing a mighty work. Pray for Israel. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you for your word. It's living and breathing and sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The misunderstanding that if you go to Israel, the Bible will come alive. What a statement of stupidity. The Bible is already alive. It's living and breathing. What happens is we come alive to your word. We start to realize the fulfillment and the brilliance of it all. Your handiwork. You never give up. You never quit. You never relent. Even when we're trying to force away the buzzards and trying to keep this covenant, we wait upon you and we're exhausted. It's then and only then that you pass through the pieces for when our, in our weakness, your strength is made perfect. When, when we fail, you don't. That God be true and every man a liar. You said forever and you meant it. And we believe it and we take you at your word. We thank you for this gift of Israel. Our firstborn, and we are grafted in, and that's okay, as long as I can be part of your family, God. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.